Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, everyone. Today, I am bringing a case where I will be asking for your help. It's still an active investigation, and it involves someone on the U.S. Marshal's 15 Most Wanted Fugitives. This guy, Raymond R.J. McLeod, has been on the run for five years. He is suspected in the murder of Crystal Mitchell, and it is suspected that he has traveled south to Central and South America. For this reason, I am releasing this episode in Spanish language as well, because the more ears this episode touches, the better the likelihood that R.J. will be forced out of hiding. So share, 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 share this episode. And I'm going to post his picture on my social media so that you can share that as well. You never know when someone might recognize him. Join me today as I tell you the very tragic story of Crystal Mitchell and the hunt for her alleged killer, Raymond R.J. McLeod, a U.S. Marine veteran. Now, let's dig in. This story was researched and written in collaboration with one of our very own listeners and fan club members, Myrtle. The sources for this episode include episodes of In Pursuit, Crime Watch Daily, and America's Most Wanted, podcast episodes by The Murder Squad and Unsolved Mysteries, and websites My Ambles, U.S. Marshall's website, Arizona Central, Marine Corps Times, The Columbian, News 7 San Diego, and True Crime Daily. A website is also dedicated to Crystal's case called Angels of Justice, so make sure that you check that out. And there's a book by Josephine Wenzel titled, quote, The Chase in Hot Pursuit of My Daughter's Killer, end quote. Now, Josephine just released this book less than a month ago, and I highly recommend it. Crystal J. Mitchell was born on May 21st, 1986 to her mother, Josephine Wenzel, and her father, Guy Mitchell. Crystal grew up in Vancouver, Washington, in a large family full of close and extended members of the family. She had a brother and a sister, plus she had bonus siblings. She had a stepbrother and a stepsister by her stepfather, Michael Wenzel. Michael was practically her father. He had known her since she was 10 years old. And Crystal was really close with her numerous aunts and uncles and cousins, and she was just friends with everyone. From an early age, Crystal was known as a prankster. According to her mom, when her family saw her coming, they knew someone was about to get tickled, pinched, or tackled. (laughs) And her mom said that for everything that she did, she had such a giving spirit. If she met someone who was cold, she would take the jacket off her back to give it to them. Crystal was beautiful, and she had lots of young men who vied for her attention. But they had to go through her brothers first. By the time she was 24, Crystal was married. And within two years, she had two children, a son, Blake, followed quickly by a daughter, Farah. Crystal's first husband and father of her children, he served in the army and was an Iraq war veteran who had been severely injured by a roadside bomb while on deployment. They loved each other, but his recovery was extremely difficult on the family, and it soon became too much for their marriage, and they agreed to divorce. Crystal was granted full custody of Blake and Farah. Since she wasn't going to have to worry about, you know, shared custody with her ex-husband, she decided she wanted to pursue her dreams. She was almost 30 years old and tired of the cold and wet winters in Vancouver. Crystal announced to her mother, Josephine, that she was going to move from Washington to Arizona to start a new life for herself and for her kids. She always wanted to be a real estate agent because it was a job that it would allow her to have flexibility to be able to spend more time with her kids. And as soon as she got settled into her new home in Paradise Valley, Arizona, she hit the ground running looking for a job. And it didn't take long for her to land one. And she found a position managing a large apartment complex on Bell Road in Phoenix. To go along with the new location and the new job, 
she was also ready to put her past behind her and she wanted to start dating again. According to her close friend, Diana Olivares, Crystal was kind and giving and she always had a big smile on her face. She was very bubbly. Crystal's personality made her the life of the party and that meant that it wouldn't be hard for her to find a match. And Diana knew that Crystal wanted to find a man that could not only be a good role model, but also a father figure for her kids. She wanted someone who would respect her and love her children the way that she did. And when the two friends talked, Crystal told Diana, hey, come visit me anytime that you're sick and tired of all the rain in Vancouver. In early 2016, Crystal went on a few dates with this guy, but it didn't work out. Crystal was ready to move on from this guy, but he wasn't ready to let Crystal go. A couple of months after their first date, he actually started calling her and was being really aggressive about wanting to get back together. Crystal had no interest in rekindling anything with this guy, but unfortunately, he wouldn't take no for an answer. One day, things got pretty scary. The man broke into the gated apartment complex where she lived. He went up on Crystal's patio and started banging on her door. Now, that is terrifying. After that happened, she told her mom that she had a recurring nightmare where she was chased by a huge snake and couldn't get away from it. Crystal didn't want her children being at risk with this crazy dude on the loose. So in May, she decided to send them back to Washington to spend the summer with her parents. Well, a few days before the kids left, Crystal met someone new, a man named Raymond R.J. McLeod. R.J. was a prospective tenant where she was working, and Crystal worked in the front office of that apartment complex. Big brawny R.J. made an instant impression on Crystal. She called her mom and told her that she met a great guy who asked her out on a date. R.J., well, he was a single dad and had a seven-year-old son at the time. According to Crystal, he doted on his son. He was dressed nicely and he looked like, mm, like a bodybuilder. Crystal's coworker and friend Beverly Polk said that she liked that, quote, gym rat type, end quote. <laughs> now, Crystal proudly announced to her mom that RJ, well, he passed his background check and wasn't a felon. She was kind of joking, but kind of not, because Crystal knew that her mom would want to know that. Josephine, Crystal's mother, she was a former police detective on the island of Guam, and she always, I mean, always ran background checks on the men that Crystal was dating. And listen, that's not the kind of mom that you want to mess with. But beyond being felony free, Crystal also told her mom that RJ was a former Marine, and this made her feel protected. Turns out that Crystal's sister was also a Marine, so it made Crystal feel good about RJ. And you know, as I always say on the show, we always tend to feel safer around veterans. A few days after RJ applied for the apartment, he was already in Crystal's office making her giggle. Beverly recalled seeing their interaction and she thought it was kind of cute. Once his application was approved, RJ quickly moved in. Crystal later told her mom that there were lots of pictures of RJ's son in his apartment, and this made her believe that he must be a great father. In May of 2016, Diana, Crystal's friend from Washington, she took Crystal up on her offer to visit and she made a trip down to Phoenix. It was Crystal's 30th birthday and Diana wanted to help her friend celebrate. Turns out RJ was around quite a bit during the weekend that she was there. And Diana said that she could tell that Crystal felt a sense of safety around RJ and it made her feel like her stalker ex-boyfriend, the one who was pounding on her door one day, it made her feel like he wouldn't be able to hurt her. Diana saw that RJ even gave Crystal one of his guns to keep at her apartment for protection in case the ex-boyfriend came around again. But there was one thing, though. The minute Diana laid eyes on RJ, she didn't like him. It was like instant. She was like, mm, don't like this guy. Crystal asked Diana, so what do you think about RJ? And Diana was honest. I mean, that's what best friends are for, right? He told her that she didn't think that they were going to work out, but admitted that she might feel that way because they had vastly different tastes in men. Diana later told Josephine for the book, though, that she, quote, thought he was a white supremacist because of his tattoos, end quote. From the little bit of time Diana spent around RJ, he seemed to be too possessive. Crystal gave RJ the once over and she was, you know, willing to give it a try. He checked all of the boxes for her. Former Marine, check. Single dad, check. Blended family, here we come. Bodybuilder, check. A clean background check, dunzo. 
All these qualities made Crystal more attracted to RJ. She felt like he was the right person to be in a relationship with. And on June 9th, after going on just three dates together, RJ asked Crystal to go with him on a quick trip to San Diego, California. And Crystal was totally down with that. Her mom said that she loved, loved, loved San Diego. She loved the beaches there so much that, of course, she wasn't going to say no to a weekend trip. So they set off together in Crystal's car for the five hour drive. The plan was to stay with one of RJ's old Marine buddies. He was married and the couple actually had an eight month old baby. They lived on Mission Gorge Road in San Diego, California, and there was nothing intimidating about the weekend arrangements at all. Sounds pretty safe, right? Crystal talked to Diana when she was about an hour outside of San Diego. Diana said that she sounded so happy and just excited to be going to one of her favorite places. Josephine texted Crystal as well during the drive and told her to take care and be safe. In typical mom fashion, Josephine told Crystal, hey, let me know what's going on when you get there. And they were about to end their conversation when Josephine insisted that Crystal send her a picture of RJ so that she knew what he looked like and Crystal complied. Turns out those pictures would become very important to Josephine. And that would be the last time that she ever spoke to her daughter. RJ and Crystal arrived at the friend's house that afternoon and they hung out there for a while. They ate dinner and they had a few drinks. And when the couple decided to go to bed early because hello, they had a new baby. I totally get it. RJ and Crystal decided to hit up the bars. Sometime into the evening, they got into an ugly argument when a third party bystander tried to intervene. RJ attacked, punching this person and laying them out. They booked it out of the bar and headed back to the friend's apartment. When RJ and Crystal left the bar, it was the last known time anyone saw Crystal alive. The next day on June 10th, Diana and Josephine both tried to call and text Crystal, but she never answered. As the day wore on, Josephine had a sick feeling in the pit of her stomach that something just wasn't right. Back in San Diego, RJ's friends had gotten up early and started their day. The spare bedroom door was closed and they knew that RJ and Crystal had gone out really super late and they thought they just needed to sleep. The wife went to work while the husband stayed home with the baby. At around 10 o'clock, he left the house and ran a few errands. And when he got back, the door was still closed with no sound coming from the room. He thought it was odd, but you know, he wanted to respect their privacy and he let them sleep. Around 1 p.m., though, he decided he was going to check on them because it was eerily quiet. He knocked on the door, but no one answered. Slowly, he turned the knob and peered in. And that's when he noticed that the room was a wreck. He could actually see blood on the wall and the carpet. And once he opened the door all the way, he could see Crystal laying lifeless on the bed. He checked for a pulse and couldn't feel one. And Crystal was cold to the touch. He immediately called 911 and the police arrived and they started surveying the scene. There were obvious signs of a struggle in the room and they quickly realized the cause of death. Crystal had received blunt force trauma to her face and torso, but the obvious cause of death was strangulation. It was so violent that the bones in her neck were fractured. RJ allegedly had used his own hands to squeeze the life out of Crystal. Josephine had been trying to text Crystal all day, pleading for her daughter. Please just just answer me. Just tell me that you're okay. And finally, Josephine's phone rang. Her husband, Mike, answered, and it was a detective from San Diego. He had the worst news a mother could possibly hear. Her daughter was dead and she was in a morgue. In Josephine's book, The Chase, she describes this very moment. And you can feel the tension as you read it. Her description is so vivid that you almost feel like your soul is being ripped out right alongside her. The thought of that notification. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist? Someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone. Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. 
and I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. HBO Max presents Love and Death. It is human nature to take risks. Would you be interested in having an affair? Starring Elizabeth Olsen and Jesse Plemons. You need to be careful. Betty Gore was murdered by someone she knew. The new Max original limited series, Love and Death, premiering April 27th on HBO Max. The truth has a way of coming out. Listen to the official Love and Death podcast wherever you get your podcasts. From the very beginning, Raymond R.J. McLeod was the primary suspect. The police said all the evidence pointed to him. He was missing from the scene along with Crystal's white infinity that they had driven to San Diego in. The police realized that RJ used it to escape. They put out a bolo or a be on the lookout for her car. And on the morning of June 12th, it was found abandoned at the San Diego airport in the parking lot. Now they checked all the flights, but they came up empty handed. RJ, it appeared, had not flown out from the airport. But why was Crystal's car there then? Investigators checked all means of transportation and boom, they soon discovered that RJ had rented a car from the airport and drove across the border into Mexico. What? The next day, June 13th, the rental car was found 1,200 miles south of San Diego in Mazatlan, Mexico. But U.S. authorities didn't find this out until five months later. Let me repeat that. The police didn't find out until five months later. McLeod wasn't a very smart dude. He had used his own identification to cross the border. But since he crossed before the bolo went out, Border Patrol didn't know to report his crossing. Now, if you're wondering how he was able to stay on the run for so long, records later showed that his parents allegedly wired $10,000 to him at some point after Crystal was killed. By the way, according to Josephine's book, Josephine reached out to RJ's family to see if they could provide any details. But in a very Brian dirty laundry fashion, if you know, you know, RJ's parents obtained an attorney and they haven't said a word. The district attorney in San Diego issued a felony arrest warrant for Raymond Samuel McLeod Jr. for the murder of Crystal Mitchell. Sadly, two days after Crystal's murder, Josephine received a call from a man, and it turns out that he was the father of one of RJ's ex-wives. The father told Josephine that what happened to her daughter was supposed to happen to his daughter. Of course, Josephine was like, what are you talking about? So she checked into RJ's past and Josephine discovered that RJ had been working as a private investigator and an insurance salesman. And according to Josephine, RJ apparently was trying to get into the business of fugitive recovery. Excuse me, what? The irony is just too much to handle sometimes in this case. According to her book, in 2009, RJ was charged with, get this, domestic violence for assaulting his first wife and his son. RJ eventually pled guilty and entered into a domestic violence diversion program. Another charge from March of 2016 was filed against RJ for attempted murder of his third wife where he, get this, strangled her. And according to the book, San Diego County DA Summer Stevens said of the incident that the only reason that RJ's third wife survived is because her friends were present and they broke it up. 
that incident happened almost three months to the day before Crystal was killed. That means that he was out on $50,000 bond when he dated and ultimately killed Crystal. What? Wait, did you catch that? He was out on bond with felony charges. And what? He had three wives? Yes, but he never bothered to mention that to Crystal. And the felony charges? What's up with that? I thought Crystal said that they had ran a background check on him. Well, get this. Crystal's mom, Josephine, always, always ran background checks on Crystal's boyfriends. But she didn't run one on RJ because Crystal assured her that the apartment application process turned up with a clean record. Well, the reason that RJ's charges weren't flagged on the apartment application report is that it was just a credit report. It didn't actually check for criminal history. Sadly, had an actual background check been run, they would have discovered the pending charges from just the month prior. Josephine realized that her intuition was right all along. The minute she saw his picture, she thought he was a bad dude. But by then, it was too late because Crystal was already in the car with him on her way to San Diego. And it's ironic because the picture that ended up on his wanted poster was the same one that Crystal sent to her mother. Josephine was relying on San Diego PD for information on the case, but they never had anything new for her. She contacted the district attorney directly and told her that nobody was looking into Crystal's murder. But the DA, the DA told her over and over again that this was still an active case. But Josephine, she wasn't satisfied with that. And as a mother, I don't think I would ever be satisfied with anyone looking into my daughter's case. And Josephine, she really dives deep into discussions about what was actually happening in her book. She says she talks about this a lot and things were chaotic for the grieving mother. She was dealing with her own grief. And let's not forget the two traumatized kids who lost their mom and eventually sitting on the sidelines and waiting for stuff to happen just became too much for Josephine. And she finally decided that enough was enough. She would begin her own investigation. You see, Josephine was a former detective, but she doesn't attribute her tenaciousness or her investigative skills to her experience as a cop. According to Josephine, she says it's because she's a grieving mother who's trying to find justice for her grandchildren in the loss of their mother. About five months after Crystal's murder, Josephine found out that all of the promises of the police work going on to find RJ was maybe not as in-depth as she had hoped because of all the yellow tape that goes on with investigative agencies having to deal with other agencies, especially when they're dealing with other countries. So in this day and age, what does one do when you want more eyeballs on an issue? That's right. You hit up social media. And that's exactly what Josephine did. She started posting on various pages looking for RJ. She was a no kidding nonfiction version of Liam Neeson in the movie Taken. She started out writing posts asking for people to help her find her daughter's murderer. And she made sure to mention the $11,000 reward for information leading to RJ's arrest, right? Because people just love money, especially when it's like reward money. Since Josephine had heard rumblings of sightings of RJ in Belize, she bombarded Belize with social media posts. She would search out hostels in the area and then she would send them warnings to watch out for McLeod with the reward as a big incentive. And she would send the wanted poster. And through some tips, she ended up learning about a Facebook group called Belize Buy and Sale. And she was told like, hey, if you want to get people in Belize to respond, post it on this Facebook page. And once she posted about RJ in that group, her inbox started blowing up. She got tips from American expats saying that RJ had been in their bar or he had stayed in their hostel. And Josephine refers to this time in the hunt as, quote, the surge. She was being bombarded with information left and right from people who had seen McLeod or thought they had seen him. And a friend of hers told her about geofencing. So they start using that tactic on Twitter. Basically, geofencing is setting up search parameters to locate information in a particular geographic area. And they knew that McLeod was in Central America. So they concentrated their search efforts there. And it paid off. One day, Josephine came across a story that a British travel blogger had written during a trip to Guatemala, where he stayed at the now famous hostel in Livingston, Guatemala. In it, the blogger wrote, quote, Matt, who had met us at the gate, was an ex-soldier, ex-bodybuilder and ex-security consultant, a.k.a. mercenary, who had moved out here to lead a more peaceful life. 
nice most of the time. Unfortunately, he was super creepy towards Alex on her last night, which left a very sour taste. He also loved cocaine and strippers. Not to be judgmental or anything, dot, dot, dot. But I don't consider those as strong marks of character. He had been passing through and started working here when he met Jerome, end quote. And the blog post goes on. But Josephine finished reading the blog and she was convinced that it had to be RJ. The blog continued, quote, learned a bit more about Matt, too. He'd been married three times, most recently to a coked up hooker in Vegas. Also heard about how much he loved cocaine, but never smoked it as crack. Fun, fun, fun. I went to sleep at 1 a.m. When we woke up at 5 a.m. to leave, he was still awake, super drunk, but just cognizant enough to hit on Alex. Nice, end quote. Josephine Quick followed up with the lead and contacted the hostel and confirmed that RJ had been there. She also sent the blogger a copy of RJ's picture and the blogger confirmed, yep, that's the guy I saw. And just like that, a desperate mom found one of RJ's hiding spots. She dug in and found out that RJ had been staying at the hostel and he had been working for them doing odd jobs to pay for his stay. And he was super paranoid. Actually, in order to stay at the hostel, people are supposed to surrender their passports to ensure payment. But RJ, instead of surrendering his passport, he just paid his dues on a daily basis. And listen, to top it off, as Josephine did her digging, she realized that RJ had actually been accused of possibly beating a woman while in Guatemala. And then there was a dispute between RJ and the owner of the hostel where he was staying. Well, there were whispers about RJ after the Australian owner of the hotel ended up dead with a broken neck at the bottom of an empty swimming pool. The owner, a man named Jerry, when he was alive, he actually felt like he was in danger before his death. And then he turned up dead. But not just the owner. Before the owner died, the owner's dog wound up dead too. According to one of Josephine's contacts, the dog was bludgeoned to death while in its cage. Holy crap. Josephine discovered that RJ was using a Canadian passport that had the first name of Matt or Matthew on it, and sometimes he went by the name Mateo. Once Josephine discovered RJ's whereabouts at some point, she ran into so many roadblocks, like trying to get a judge to get a search warrant because she wasn't a police officer, you know? Unfortunately, by the time local police in Livingston got the information about RJ, he was long gone. And Josephine was back to square one. She was beyond frustrated that her tips were either ignored or that it took weeks for the information to get through the red tape to the right people. So who is RJ? Raymond Samuel McLeod Jr. was born on October 3rd, 1983. His parents lived in Scottsdale, Arizona, and there isn't a lot of information out there about his life, but here's what we do know of him and what to be on the lookout for. RJ served in the Marine Corps and was demoted before being discharged. He has allegedly deployed twice, once to Haiti and once to Iraq. He also has portrayed himself as a Marine recruiter. But according to people who have reached out to Josephine, RJ was never actually assigned as a recruiter. Maybe he did some recruitment, but he should not be calling himself a recruiter. People who knew RJ in the Marine Corps said that he was known to be a hothead. He took steroids, so he may be looking to score more of them soon or at some point in the last five years. And he loved to work out, so he may be hanging out around gyms. We don't know. He has a stutter when he gets nervous and he doesn't speak fluent Spanish. He likes to hang around touristy areas and stay in hostels because they're cheap and he can kind of blend in. He likes to hit on women. He drinks heavily and is known to use cocaine. He has a crap ton of really distinguishing tattoos. On his left arm, he has a fallout shelter symbol, a spider web, a skull, and a gigantic Marine Corps symbol. On his right arm, he has an iron cross and floral design on his forearm. His elbow has a tattoo that resembles stitches branching out from the center. He also has a handgun and a skull tattooed on his bicep. He was last seen using a Canadian passport and could be going by the name Matt or Matthew Rodriguez, or even Mateo. RJ or Ray are common nicknames for him, and apparently he also liked to be called Maverick. He should be considered armed and dangerous, 
so if you see him, do not approach him. Before this case, the U.S. Marshals had never used social media to hunt for fugitives. Josephine, of course, was outraged that they weren't set up to use social media because in this day and age, come on. She got so many leads through Twitter and Facebook that the Marshals are completely clueless about. Josephine pushed for and was successful with having RJ added to the U.S. Marshals' top 15 most wanted list. And it turns out that they have since started using social media as a tool during investigations. The U.S. Marshals made a huge move and they have issued a $50,000 reward for his capture. Quote, McLeod will be the first fugitive in history on the 15 most wanted list with an initial reward that high, end quote. And this is according to the U.S. Marshals Service Director Donald Washington, as quoted in Arizona Central and the Marine Corps Times. Director Washington went on to say that, quote, McLeod poses a significant threat to the public and must be brought to justice, end quote. We all know that he was in Mazatlan. He's also been spotted in Corozal, Belize, Livingston, Guatemala, and is thought to be bouncing between the countries in Central America. And I'm going to add South America because, you know, it's all so close together. The last time that he was seen in person was in March of 2017 in Livingston, Guatemala. John Walsh of In Pursuit said, quote, let me give you a piece of advice. If you ever find yourself face to face with Raymond R.J. McLeod, turn around and run away, end quote. The Murder Squad podcast interviewed Josephine for their segment on RJ, and the guys asked Josephine what she would say to RJ McLeod if she could. She replied, quote, give yourself up, just give yourself up. End this search so that my family and I can close this one chapter and give your own family rest, because I'm sure they have their own problems with you doing what you did, end quote. If you're listening to this episode and you have any information about RJ's whereabouts, please contact the U.S. Marshals as soon as possible. They can be reached at 1877-WANTED-2. And that's 1877-926-8332. Or you can submit a tip online at usmarshals.gov slash tips. As I mentioned at the start of this episode, Josephine Wenzel recently published a book titled The Chase in Hot Pursuit of My Daughter's Killer. I read it in 48 hours. It's a super easy read, but be prepared to cry because you can feel this poor mom's blood, sweat and tears as she writes about the most horrific experience that a mother can ever experience. The death of a child at the hands of murder. She talks about her experience with law enforcement agencies. She talks about her dealings with online swindlers who preyed on a broken mother. She writes about it all. All of the proceeds from the book will go to her continued search for Crystal's killer. So go out and buy it right now. I'm going to link where you can purchase the book in my show notes. So make sure you check it out. What breaks my heart the most about this entire case is the loss of a five and six year old's mommy. They left during summer break and never saw mommy again. Even though those poor little babies have an amazing grandma and a family that is still fighting for justice, I can only imagine the world where they live in, where mommy was killed and the killer is still on the loose. Just before Crystal put her kids on the plane to go to Washington, she took them to Build-A-Bear and she had a very special stuffed animal made for them. She recorded her voice and put the recordings inside the Build-A-Bears. It's the last thing the kids have left of their mother. They are now roughly 10 and 11 years old. I want to end this episode with a quote from Josephine's book. This is her plea for you to help find Raymond McLeod. Quote, as I have mentioned to many, I am not seeking revenge for revenge belongs to God. I am seeking justice. This man is dangerous and has no business being on the streets. He's a menace to society and needs to face the consequences of his actions. End quote. Josephine, thank you so much for communicating with me and allowing me to tell your daughter's story. Thank you so much for listening to this very important episode. This is still an active case, and that is why we need your help. Only you can spread the word about this case. Share Raymond's picture on all of your social media accounts. Clearly, Raymond's network is strong because he has been hiding for over five years. 
So it's our turn to make Crystal's network even stronger. Check out Josephine's book, That's the Number One Priority. And also check out her website, angelsofjustice.com. On this website, you can watch both Crime Watch Daily episodes. You can also watch the America's Most Wanted episode. And Josephine has linked RJ's criminal record documents on this website as well. If you want to follow me on social, I can be found on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and on TikTok at Military Margot with a T at the end. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced by my boot camp and higher fan club members. The music was created by Ty Ops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Podcast.